evening, everyone. Uh, thank you for coming out to my talk uh, called Domain Persistence Detection, Triage, and Recovery. Um, I am Joshua Prager. I am the service principal for our defensive services at Spectre Ops. Been with Spectre Ops for five and a half years. Um, I got my start as a humble help desk technician in the United States Navy. Um, enlisted, worked my way up for seven years until I left as a Navy Red Team member. Um, I'm one of those active duty personnel who left in a uniform and walked right back in in a suit and tie. Um, I did that for a little while, then eventually I just did a complete change of career and instead of going Red Team, I went uh, Blue Team after I left the Navy completely. Um, I went threat hunting and detection engineering. I worked with in-game systems, Accenture Federal Services, Woo, for those of y'all that are in here, part of that. Um, and eventually I found my way at Spectre Ops, and I've been there for about half a decade now. All right? Um, this talk was also made with Nico Shine. Um, he is also a prior Navy guy. We didn't do that on purpose. All right, we're just friends. Um, but, well, we built this, this talk together. However, he lives all the way out in Alexandria, Virginia. He couldn't make it out here to San Antonio, so I will be giving the talk solo. All right? Okay, so the purpose of this presentation was because I did a compromise assessment for a client that was severely compromised. Um, we had identified uh, evidence of credential dumping on the domain controllers. We found, we found proof of the compromised um, certificate authorities. It was like, you know, you know, that keep calm, burn down the whole forest kind of meme. That's basically it's the scenario. And in this compromise report, the client was like, hey, what do I do? And I'm like, whoa, this is really bad. I don't even know where to start. Um, so I kind of made this presentation as a, 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 a form, at least a boilerplate starting point for the community out there because when I was trying to find um, resources and recommendations for this client, I really couldn't find much other than very high level Microsoft documentation that was a little bit unrealistic, okay? So um, starting off, we want to make sure that we can detect certain techniques um, from there, we want to make sure that we are understanding the different caveats and evasion, operational guidance. So if you are a penetration tester, you're an adversary simulation person, this is also going to pertain to you as well. We'll talk about those operational caveats, that operational flow of these different techniques, and then how to remediate uh, if we see any of these techniques in our environment. Okay? All right, so domain persistence doesn't equal some MITRE ATT&CK technique ID. There's not a domain persistence thing out there. I think there's one where it talks about a domain account persistence, but that's not really the same thing. All right, what we're talking about specifically is anywhere elevated uh, access to the environment is maintained in such a way that it would, it's, it's very difficult to root out the adversary, okay? Um, the United Health Group uh, attack recently um, in that letter that is public, that the FTC sent to the Biden administration, like the very first complaint was UHG got ransomware, and what they did was start from scratch. That's, that's what you're supposed to do. Most companies, most organizations don't have the money and the resources to start from scratch. We're gonna talk a little bit about what happens when you don't have the money and the resources to start from scratch, okay? All right, so we're gonna talk about credential theft on domain controller, we're gonna talk about NTDS access, DC sync, golden ticket, diamond ticket, ADCS certificate attacks, um, and SCCM or config manager site takeover, okay? All right, so starting off with credential theft on domain controller, okay? Um, a lot of red teamers, even a lot of defenders who've been trained by red teamers, um, we, we, we tend to get this bias, right? That the adversary is either going to start from a low privileged fished user, or they're gonna start with like, you know, a rogue access point or rogue, rogue device in the environment. They're essentially gonna be constrained in their operation, and they have to go through this narrative and attack path to eventually find their way to domain admin, where they can do credential dumping to gain things like the golden, the, the Caribbean TGT to get the golden ticket, things like that. The truth is, a lot of actual criminal adversaries are just doing spray and pray methods across entire industry verticals. They're just, there's, you know, 2019, whatever, whatever SharePoint vulnerability for all forward facing SharePoints, and they just spray this attack at the entire industry vertical. And if you happen to work for government, federal, whatever, whatever, you get hit with this, right? They get that access. This is, let, let, let's consider it for a second. If we're talking about a vulnerable web server that's forward facing, Okay, what is the service that operates most of our forward-facing web servers? Usually we're talking about things like the IIS worker service. What happens when an adversary abuses a vulnerable service? What access do they gain immediately? 
system, right? Because all services execute under the context of the system. So a lot of these real attack paths don't start with a low privilege user working their way up to domain admin. A lot of them start with, they got system access on a web server, they dumped credentials on that web server, and they literally use those credentials to laterally move to a domain controller. A two-step process. Two-step process, they're immediately elevated permissions on the domain controller where they can dump credentials, okay? Some operational caveats when it comes to domain, uh, domain controller credential dumping. Um, ideally, operationally, it's the same, okay? The, the caveat actually is that on a domain controller, credential guard is not usually turned on. In fact, Microsoft actually recommends it against turning on credential guard because if you, tur if you turn on credential guard on a domain controller in your average environment, that inhibits the use of um, using Kerberos, that inhibits the use of using NTLM, you bork your whole domain, okay? So in most situations, you can't turn on credential guard. That means if an adversary is able to get local admin ask access on the domain controller, at that point, like there's really nothing stopping them from doing credential dumping. The good news, is that if an adversary does credential dumping on the domain controller, usually it's any interactive domain admin accounts they'd be targeting. They can't actually get things like the KRB TGT from credential dumping on the domain controller. And the reason for that is the, the KRB TGT, it's a service account, but it's not like an interactive account in that context. You can't just dump the domain controller with Mimikatz and see the KRB TGT. You'd have to use something like DC Sync, okay? Which we'll talk about here in a second. From a detection perspective, right, we have process creation events we can use as telemetry. We have a process requested a handle with event ID 4656, or uh, we can set a SACL as well and do 4663. Um, we can also use Sysmon, event ID 10. Most of the event IDs I'm going to use are going to be Windows native event IDs or Sysmon. Um, and this one context in this one slide, I promise. It has Defender for Endpoints, Read Process Memory Telemetry. Um, you're not going to have that in every scenario, though. At the very top, you might be wondering yourself, we're talking about credential dumping. Usually, we're talking about process access. Why do you have process creation up there? Um, in that case, we're talking about uh, process snapshotting. So it's a way to evade that process access attempt. I can create a snapshot of the LSAS process. So you'll see LSAS with a child process of LSAS. Super suspicious, OK? OK, so moving on into NTDS.dit access, all right? The Active Directory Users and Computers database lives in a file called ntds.dit on the domain controller. Um, you can abuse, as, and as an adversary, you can abuse the volume, the volume shadow copy service to go and create a snapshot, um, a, a shadow copy of the domain controller itself, which then allows you to go after the ntds.dit file. Because normally, ntds.dit is a hard locked file or, or deadlocked file. You'll produce an error code, like a kernel error code, if you try to manipulate it while Active Directory users and computers is using it, which of course it's always using it in a pretty much constant AD domain, right? Um, we can set a SACL on the ntds.dit file. Uh, by default, there isn't like a ntds.dit SACL that's just immediately turned on. There are some default SACLs, um, and that's not one of them. So you would have to go in there. You'd have to modify that to be read file attribute, read file extended attribute, and read file data. That way, when that volume shadow uh, snapshot service is started, and it does do that read of the, uh, the C drive for the domain controller, it will catch that ntds.dit file being accessed. Um, we can also use the volume shadow copy service starting itself. If you have a reoccurring scheduled task or a reoccurring persistent job on your domain controller to do volume shadow copy service, and all of a sudden you're seeing one execute at an abnormal time of day or just completely out of the blue, that would be a dead giveaway that something suspicious is going on. Okay. All right, so moving into DC Sync. DC Sync is super well known. There is a ton of event IDs out there for it. Uh, well, not event ID. There's a ton of... Um, detection uh, uh, blog posts and stuff like that for it. Um, the idea here is that we're using the RPC methods get NC changes to request a copy of any changes to the domain controller. Um, it's really, really a, a, a critical attack path um, for a lot of red teams because it allows us to, in a, in, a, um, in a simulated way, grab a very high profile service account such as the KRB TGT account, which is whose NTLM hash is used to sign every Kerberos ticket in the environment. So it's, 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 it's often abused from that case. A long time ago, um, red teams would try to go after ntds.dit, or they would try some other method of getting the KRB TGT account. But it was kind of a um, kind of a gray ethical area there, because ideally, according to defensive guidance, if the ntds.dit file is at, like copied or, or taken in any way, the DPAPI master key is also copied. And that's kind of an unchangeable thing, which we'll talk about here in a little bit. Um, 
There are some caveats to DC Sync I want to talk about real quick. Um, I don't really pull it out here in these slides. Um, okay, so if you are on client one and you commit a DC Sync to domain controller one, that will go over the wire. It'll be a, it'll be like net, network traffic, right? Um, and we'll see those get RPC or get NC changes request over DCE RPC telemetry. Okay. And if you're not super familiar with this, too long didn't read, there's network logs that will tell you when someone's doing DC sync. There are a lot of vendor tools like Stealth Intercept, um, I can't think of some other ones, but there are these vendor tools who are looking for that traffic. Uh, Palo Alto firewalls, they'll look for that traffic and they'll be like, hey, DC sync alert. If I'm a red teamer, if I'm on your domain controller and if I have privileged access to your domain controller, if I'm on the domain controller that I want to DC sync, I will just target itself. It will not go over the external interface. It will go over the local loopback. And I promise you, most vendor tools are not looking at the local loopback, okay? So keep that in mind. All right, so moving on to golden ticket. So the way golden ticket works is essentially an adversary is going to request a TGT, um, or they're gonna request a TGS. They're gonna take that TGS. They're going to uh, try to get the Caribbean TGT hash from it, or they're gonna do something like DC sync, and they're gonna get that NTLM hash of the, uh, the KRB TGT account. The KRB TGT account is a service account whose sole purpose is to validate, authenticate, and sign all TGTs, all ticket granting tickets throughout your entire Kerberos environment. When this account is abused, um, that's called a golden ticket attack, and it allows a adversary to sign their own TGTs. Remember, this is the account that is used for authenticating everything, right? So if I am the account that authenticates everything, I'm authenticating to myself, and there's nothing stopping me from accessing any resource in my environment, right? So it's a very, very dangerous attack path. Unfortunately, there's not a whole lot of telemetry for it. There's not a whole lot of um, defensive guidance for it. Um, Defender for Endpoint uh, does have a couple of like suspicious use of golden and ticket alerts. They also have um, a pass the ticket alert as well. Unfortunately, you don't really get to get good insight into what the logic behind those alerts are. They don't reveal that. Um, and then a lot of them are really based on curb roasting the, the KRB TGT account. Uh, for example, the suspicious, I think it's like suspicious use of golden ticket. It's actually looking for RC4 HMAC requests for the KRB TGT service account. So it's, it's, it's not quite what it appears. It's, it's a bit difficult to figure out. Um, there are some caveats to it though. Uh, we can look for anywhere a 4769 was requested, but there's not a corresponding 4768. I have worked with some clients who have developed a custom in-house version of this alert. Kind of works, kind of not. Um, but it, it, it gets a bit tricky. Also, the uh, you can monitor group membership. If you have users who, um, who you, you, you've done a good job of kind of segregating group membership, um, and all of a sudden you're seeing users with a event ID 46, 4627. Um, if you see in that 4627 for a user that belongs to a group that does not contain things like the domain admin SIDs, things like that, that's obviously super suspicious. But you'd be surprised a lot of clients have not actually generated an, a, a detection, like a custom detection that'll monitor group membership changes like that. Um, but if you do a good job of making sure your, your users are in the correct groups and alert upon any deviation of those group usage, that 40, the 4627 event ID is actually really, really important for detecting like someone taking a golden ticket and essentially attributing it to a, to a user that, doesn't, that shouldn't have those permissions, okay? All right, this is just kind of a quick attack map of how everything works. Um, so normally they're trying to go over here and they will try to, excuse me, they will try to DC sync if they have domain admin credentials. They'll get the uh, NTLM hash of the Caribbean TGT account. After that, they're going to attribute that, that NTLM hash. They're going to uh, forge a TGT for that NTLM hash of the Caribbean TGT account. They're going to apply it to a user that they've, uh, that they've compromised, or they will make a new user with their elevated credentials. And then that's how they're going to propagate throughout your environment. Okay. All right, diamond ticket. All right, we're, we're going to, like, this is as deep as we're going into, like, the Pokemon name varieties of the ticket attacks. All right. Um, <laughs> With diamond ticket, we're essentially doing the same thing as a golden ticket. The only difference is we are going to modify um, the, 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 the PAC. I'm trying to remember what PAC stands for, and I can't remember it off the top of my head. Um, yeah, I don't think we have it on there either. Um, okay, but essentially, within a TGT, okay, you have this area of the TGT called the PAC. It contains authentication header information. It contains credential information. It contains... Um, uh, essentially the things that would attribute that TGT belonging to that specific Caribbean TGT account. Um, 
but adversaries can then go and modify the pack. Luckily for us as defenders, uh, there are some really, really good ways of detecting it. Um, the pack itself, uh, you can, when you modify it, from a, even like an adversary perspective, you can't modify it the same way that Microsoft does. If I remember correctly, they encrypt it a certain way that hasn't been broken yet, and that, that particular form of encryption, you can essentially copy the pack or forge the pack, but you can't actually go in there and modify it to make it look exactly like Microsoft did it um, within the AD environment. So you can look for that. There are some, um, there are some ticket-based tooling out there that will look for that modification of that pack, and that came out very, very uh, suddenly after that diamond ticket attack was revealed. Um, one of the other things is we can detect that anomalies of the group memberships, just like we did for Golden Ticket. If you're seeing, you know, Josh Prager, who's a, a lowly user, you know, who has no business with domain admin rights, all of a sudden have like a 46, uh, what was it, 46. Uh, 4627, so if you see that 4627 event ID um, attributed to Josh Prager, the low user, who is all of a sudden has SIDS related to domain admins, like that's, that stands out as super suspicious, okay? All right, again, this is just kind of the going through the attack path here. Same kind of process, we're going to use something like DC Sync to get the NTLM hash um, of the KRBTGT account password. We're going to use that hash um, and we're going to decrypt the ticket, modify the, uh, the pack, and then we are going to apply that to a user by re-encrypting it and creating that diamond ticket, which allows us to propagate. All right, so let's get in quickly to ADCS, all right? Um, doing pretty good on time, so I'll slow down just a little bit. So for ADCS, um, Active Directory Certificate Services Abuse, okay? Um, typically these are aimed at abusing the certificate authority. Now, uh, Will Schroeder and Lee Christensen, um, our coworkers of mine over at Specter Ops, they came out with their certified pre-owned um, uh, white paper that was designed to list out all the different attack paths for ADCS. A lot of folks have read the attack path portion. A lot of folks haven't read the detection portion yet. The, there's a lot of really good defensive guidance in that paper. Um, just about every attack path scenario, they list like two to three different defensive guidance, which are either preventative controls or detective controls, which defenders can then use to prevent these ADCS attack paths from being abused. The one that I'm gonna talk about here is really just focused on um, kind of like local admin access to a certificate authority or a, um, a uh, uh, what's it called? Um, a certificate authority or the, uh, I'm trying to remember what they're called. Like the, the, the sub-certificate authorities. I don't think I have it in here though. Subordinate, there you go. The subordinate certificate authorities. Okay, so if an adversary is able to gain local admin ask, access to a certificate authority or a subordinate certificate authority, um, which honestly isn't that hard a lot of times, uh, what we found doing a lot of our, uh, our, our red teaming is that CAs and subordinate CAs, they're usually not, um, a, okay, for example, a domain controller, normally the only one who can laterally move to a domain controller would be a domain admin, right? And that's pretty typical in almost every environment. In fact, I think you have to go and nowadays have to reconfigure your AD environment to make that an attack path available because by default, only local admin, only domain admins can do that lateral movement. It's not the same when it comes to certificate authorities. A lot of times we'll see that power users are allowed to laterally move to certificate authorities. That opens up a whole new depth of users that we can abuse and compromise to gain access to a certificate authority or a subordinate CA, okay? Once we have access to those subordinate CAs um, or the certificate authority, once we can gain local admin access on them, we can enumerate the private keys of the certificate authority, we can ob obtain a decrypted DP API master key, um, and then with that, we can decrypt the certificate authority private keys. Once we have the private keys, we can then begin uh, forging certificates laterally moving throughout the environment, okay? Um, one of the things that we can do to kind of uh, prevent this from happening in the first place, when it comes to our certificate authorities that contain our private keys, um, we need to offline our certificate authorities. The amount of times I have been in discussions with clients and I say, do you have an online certificate authority? And they say yes, and I'm like, you know, you should probably offline that. And they go, well, we can't because of excuse, excuse, excuse. It's a very, very dangerous attack vector. I'm gonna go over remediation here in just a little bit. That's kind of why I'm rushing a little bit. Um, but when I go into remediation, you're gonna be like, okay, I gotta rotate this, I gotta rotate that, cool. When we get to the certificate authority portion of the remediation, that is 99% of the hardest part of the effort, okay? Uh, it takes a lot to recover from certificate authority abuse, right? So keep that in mind. Um, we can set SACLs on uh, our, our private keys. Um, 
Studying those tackles will allow us to identify any suspicious processes accessing um, the, the, the private key on there in a situation where our private key is not being stored on a CA that's offline, okay? So it's kind of like the, the remediation and defensive guidance I can give for folks who, who do have those caveats and reasons they can't offline their CA. Additionally, that certified pre-owned white paper like I talked about contains a lot of these event IDs um, that I have listed up here. We can look for things like 5058 that will uh, display an operation on a key file. Um, we can look for any time an account, a user, opened a key file. We can look for any time a, a, a user exported a key file. Essentially, there's a ton of event IDs and telemetry that a lot of users or um, a lot of clients are not ingesting that contain all the necessary information to let you know, hey, someone's stealing your keys to, like, to the whole kingdom. It's, it's kind of a bad thing. All right, so keep that in mind. Like I said, if you haven't read that certified pre-owned white paper, highly recommend you go through, at least look at the defensive guidance um, and, 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 and definitely bolster your defensive capacity. All right, so this last technique that I'm gonna talk about is SCCM uh, site takeover or configuration manager takeover. Um, I, I am a principal over here at Spectre Ops, so it has been a while since I've been able to do any kind of like really cool red teaming, but I did jump into a red team pretty recently um, where we did uh, SCCM or configuration manager site takeover. And this was a really fun one because the client was, uh, we, had, we, we frequently do red teams for this client. And you know, at the beginning of the op, they were telling uh, the assessment lead, they were like, hey, uh, it's really, really cool. We added all these new defensive products in here. We're not going to tell you what they are, but we're feeling pretty confident about it. You, know, you, you give it. give it your best shot. And, and so we were like, all right, we'll do our best. Um, and so we went into this and we got, uh, we got site takeover for SCCM within five hours. Uh, the, the, the assessment lead uh, kicked off the internal assessment with a bang. Um, and the, uh, the POC, was the, the client, they were very upset. And he literally said, I'm not upset at you, but I am very upset. Um, so. Configuration Manager is a, a, a super big attack path that um, when, 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 when leveraged, um, essentially the red team or the criminal actors can gain administrative control over your entire environment because you need administrative control to manage your entire environment, which is the whole reason we have SCCM or Configuration Manager, right? And abusing those privileges is significantly easier than you would realize, especially if you've never looked into Configuration Manager abuse uh, before. Um, before I jump into this, uh, there is a project by uh, Dwayne, Michael, and Chris Thompson. Um, and then I did the defensive detection guidance in there. I need to go back through and add some more in there. Um, but this project is called Misconfiguration Manager. Um, and its, it's, it's whole uh, purpose is to enumerate all these different attack paths. And uh, we published it, and Windows even went in and made some new change that remediated the very first attack path. So good on Windows for, for good on Microsoft for listening and making, making that change. All right, so let's talk about how easy this is to do, okay? I'm gonna talk about coercion and relay. Show of hands, who has heard of coercion and relay attacks recently? Right, it's, it's, it's been making a lot of cybersecurity news lately. It's, it's, it's significantly easier to do than, you, than, than from a defensive perspective you would realize, okay? Um, from a, uh, a, a coercion perspective, um, I can have access to, let's just say, client A. I compromised client A as a red teamer, okay? The SCCM site server, I enumerated it, I know it exists, I know exactly what its IP address is. I can coerce, I can say, hey, give me your NTLM authentication. I can coerce that NTLM authentication, it's gonna give me that NTLM authentication to my compromised host, and then I'm gonna set up what's called a relay, and that relay is gonna catch that authentication and pass it on to target two, or, or, or client two, okay? Essentially, if I, if I commit this attack from a SCCM or a Configuration Manager site server, I am authenticating to client two as SCCM because I'm just simply passing the creds along. And now I have control as SCCM over cl client or target two, okay? So that's like super bad, right? Um, Everything that Configuration Manager does, it does so in the capacity of um, a local administrator access. Right? So essentially, by coercing and relaying credentials from the SCCM site server, I am giving myself local admin access on whatever target machine I want. Ideally, I'm gonna target something like an SQL database, I'm gonna give myself access to like RBAC admins, and then from there I'm going to gain full administrative control over the domain environment, okay? Five hours, tops in a massive like 60K endpoint environment. It, you can do this and, it, and it's crazy how easy it is. Um, when I saw our assessment lead do it, I was like, oh my God, I gotta like write a blog about this or, or, or tell somebody, this is super bad. <laughs> All right, 
Luckily, there are some ways that we can detect it as defenders, okay? So typically, there's only two locations you'll ever see that SCCM machine account logging in, okay? It's gonna log into itself, or it's gonna log into the domain controller. You're gonna see a event ID 4624 successful logon event um, for the SCCM site server account, machine account. All right. If at any point you see the SCCM site server account logging into something other than itself or the domain controller, that is highly suspicious and probably uh, an indicator of coercion and relay. Uh, if you look at that picture right there, we have a logon type three with 4624. The username is the SCCM site server and it's logging into server two, not the SCCM server, okay? All right. Um, and this is just kind of reiterating what I said. Uh, from an enumeration perspective, if you want to protect um, yourself from an adversary trying to enumerate what your SCCM site servers are, you can set SACLs on the Active Directory systems, uh, system management container and Active Directory. Um, and that's going to set a SACL on there to let you know any like suspicious process or account that is enumerating your SCCM site server accounts because that's where when you establish SCCM and set it up in your environment, that's the part of Active Directory it gets tossed into, okay? All right, so we got remediation. We're cutting it close. We got, we got a little bit of time left, all right? Okay, so I talked about a lot of different um, techniques out there, right? Gave you some offensive caveats, some defensive caveats, gave you detection guidance. Like I said, Please don't try to like absorb and take notes as fast as I talk. It's, it's not going to work out. Just like I said, go to GitHub, Specter Ops, and look up domain persistence or whatever, and you can you can get all of these event IDs and all these data models. Those data models I showed you with those event IDs, that's exactly what I give the clients. Um, the, you're, you're seeing my day-to-day -day job. Um, Okay, so when I originally made this, I made this as a blog series, and my manager was like, hey, it'd be really cool if you did remediation guidance for each technique, right? And I was like, that would be cool. Unfortunately, if I see any of these techniques, I'm gonna wanna still go down the same path. So it, it, it doesn't matter. Like, it's, it's the same steps if we see any of these techniques, all right? Um, you know, barring, you know, you deconflicted and found out it was a red team. If this is a real compromise event and you saw any of those detections fire, this is like, oh no, burn down the forest, what do I do? This is what you do, okay? Now this is gonna be high level, everybody's domain is different, everybody's environment's different, and now we got hybrid everywhere. Um, it, there are a ton of caveats, there are a ton of like gotchas. You got to come up with your own scenarios, but what I find, um, by doing a lot of program development, a lot of defensive program development clients, is that even though they know they should do this, and even though they know they should have these plans, they don't always go and test these plans, or most of the time they don't even have these plans, okay? So this is that, that encouragement to like, um, make sure we have a, oh no, burn down the forest scenario plan, okay? All right, um, so what we're gonna talk about is determining the scope, replacing or reprovisioning domain controllers, rotating accounts and object secrets, rotating certificates, and then uh, enabling additional auditing, right? Um, so after that domain compromise scenario with that client, I went to all my other clients that I do defensive program dev with, and I said, hey, let me see your run books for when you get compromised. I wanna say like only one of them was actually able to produce a run book, and then I asked them when the last time they tested it was, and they were like, not never, because it's too expensive to test it, or we don't have the expertise, or we would actually just call someone to do it for us. Um, most of my clients and uh, most clients period, most, vent, like most uh, companies period, they don't have the resources to really test and validate these things. A lot of them will do tabletops, a lot of them will do like simulated exercises. Um, but what I find is clients who go and purchase red team vendors and they say, hey, I want you to red team us. I want you to really act like a real criminal adversary. Black box testing, I'm not gonna tell my blue team, I'm not gonna tell my defensive team about it, and I want you to try to get administrative control of my environment. We'll do it, right? And then they'll catch us, they'll deconflict us, and then what they'll say is, all right, let them, let them keep having access though. Like don't, don't remediate them, don't evict them, right? We paid for this, we paid a lot of money for this red team. We don't wanna limit the scope of what they're available to do. At Spectre Ops, we actually encourage clients to try to remediate us. We encourage clients to try to evict us um, because we're pretty confident we can get around that. Like we're, we, we automate as much of our attack infrastructure as possible. So like we know we're never gonna have the same IOC hash twice. We're never gonna say, have any of the same IOCs twice. We're pretty good at getting around defenders. So if you do find us, we encourage you to try to evict us, test out those run books, test out those remediation procedures, because you don't wanna be in this compromised situation and be like, I, I thought it worked, but it doesn't, okay? 
All right, so um, we're gonna get to kind of like how to scope this. We're gonna start normally with the things that we know were affected, the alerts that were on the systems. Um, uh, and then of those systems, we're gonna see which of these were tier zero assets. This is another piece. We have to know what our tier zero assets are in our environment, okay? Um, from there, we're gonna consider the potentially affected systems. I mean, this is kind of a really important one. So I talked about a hybrid environment, right? Most organizations nowadays are hybrid environments. If you are an Active Directory on-prem environment, but you just use M365, guess what? You're still a hybrid environment, whether you realize it or not. Um, so when we're, when we're talking about things like hybrid environments, we have to also consider the scope of highly, provi uh, highly provisioned intra-ID or Azure ID, whatever they wanna call themselves today, accounts, right? Because if it is highly privileged on uh, Azure, it's also highly privileged within Active Directory most of the time as well, okay? All right, so when we're talking about on-prem specifically, um, we need to take a look at replacing or reprovisioning our domain controllers. You can take an already existing server that you know was not part of that scope or not part of that compromise, and you can uh, simply uh, elevate it to a domain controller. I say simply, that's kind of like a, an overstatement. Um, or we can reprovision like a completely new domain controller, okay? Um, there's some, there's some, there's some uh, reasons behind this, okay? There is the uh, Data Protection API or DP API master key. There's a domain specific one that every user's data is encrypted with, okay? Now, we had some researchers at SpectreOps figure out a way to actually um, rotate the domain DP API backup key, even though Microsoft says there's no way to rotate it. It's not really that there's no way to rotate it, there's just not a really safe way to do it. If, you, if something gets borked, you, ac you accidentally just ransomware your entire domain. So no one's actually gonna go through with trying to rotate this, um, but it can be rotated. Uh, but according to Microsoft, uh, there is no way to rotate the domain DP API master key. So if you don't start from scratch, remember I talked about that uh, United Health Group compromise and they got ransomware and they said we had to start from scratch. People were complaining about that in that FTC letter. However, like that's, that is probably the most secure and, and risk, um, like the best risk decision they could have made because had they not started from scratch, they would have had to accept the risk that the domain DP API master key is compromised no matter what. And there's no way to rotate that. And if the adversary was able to steal a copy of the NTDS.dit or they were able to compromise the domain DP API master key in some way, there's no way to get that back. There's no way to change that. You can go through all these remediation steps I'm about to give you and it won't matter if the adversary still has that key because they can decrypt all that data anyways, okay? But if you can't afford to start from scratch, and I would say 99.9% .9 of the world cannot afford to start from scratch, um, we're gonna go through these steps instead, okay? So here's how we replace our domain controllers. Um, like I said, I'm, we don't have the time to kind of go through all of these, I only got like 10 minutes left. Um, but the, the important parts of this that I want you to keep in mind is, when you're going through this and you're making runbooks based off this boilerplate, you have to keep in mind that you have to have checks. That's what these are, DC, uh, DCD, IAG, rep admin, rep admin. These are these checks. You have to make sure that replication has successfully occurred across your, own, your whole domain before you make these changes and as you make these changes incrementally. If something occurs where you made a change, you didn't validate that replication occurred in your domain, and then you made that second change, you could completely lock yourself out of your entire domain environment. Um, clients have done it, all right? Um, so we, 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 we gotta be really, really careful about this. Uh, luckily, uh, Microsoft does have a, a, a robust tool dedicated to remediation and uh, domain rotation, um, and there are uh, checks like already input in there that will go and make sure that rep admin is being uh, executed uh, successfully. All right, so then we gotta get to our user accounts. We need to rotate our user accounts. We're gonna start with uh, the user accounts that were uh, identified within domain compromise. Um, any tier, tier zero admin accounts that we identified, we're going to immediately rotate them as soon as possible. Um, like the SLA on that bad boy is like five minutes. Like we gotta get those immediately rotated. Um, or if we can, it's even better if we can disable them and then reprovision new domain admin accounts or, or, or tier zero accounts. Um, that way if we, if we try to see uh, signs of abuse of those disabled accounts, we know the adversary is still out there. Um, and then we have to do, uh, making sure that we identify and disable all the accounts that would have any interactive sessions on a tier zero host, okay? Um, now when we get to service accounts, service accounts are a little bit more tricky. Service accounts, uh, I haven't met a client yet that doesn't have at least you know two or three different service accounts out there that are uh, temperamental or are legacy, right? 
um, and you know, t the entire domain rests on the shoulders of these like service accounts built in like the 1990s. And if if you turn it off, all of production and corporation just like falls short. So. Highly recommend that before any sort of defensive team goes and starts trying to rotate service accounts, that they pair with security engineering. Security engineering usually has a pretty good oversight of what accounts need to exist and where they need to exist at. Um, and there are some accounts that will not be able to be rotated. There's some service accounts that have weak passwords that cannot be rotated. And we'll have to consider each one of these caveats as we go, but we need to make sure we document what each of those caveats are, okay? Uh, this is just kind of talking about collaborating with the security engineering. Okay, probably the most important one is uh, rotating the KRBTGT account, right? I like, you know, every time we, I, I talk about this, there's always someone from the back who's like, yeah, rotate the KRBTGT twice. Uh, it's a little bit more tricky than that, all right? Um, we do have to consider replication uh, all throughout the environment, just like we did for reprovisioning domain controllers. Um, so when we, when we, when we uh, rotate that KRB TGT account, we have to rotate it twice because it does contain a historical password of its previous set, all right? Um, but we, we change it, we make sure the domain replicates it, we change it again, and we make sure it replicates, all right? Machine accounts are pretty tricky. Machine accounts, um, there, there is the reset computer machine account. It will like take the machine off the domain and you have to rejoin it. Um, keep in mind though, it will not remediate uh, coercion and relay, okay? Um, there is a hot fix for uh, NTLM relay that came out a couple years ago. Um, that will remediate NTLM relay. Rotating the machine account uh, password won't, right? And then we get to trust realm objects. So in a Active Directory forest with multiple domains, um, there's a shared secured password um, that converts and uh, encrypts this key called the inner realm trust key, all right? If an adversary abuses that, essentially you have to consider both the domain that the compromise was identified in and any like joined domains compromised as well. There is some funky forward and backward uh, inner realm trust key rotation that has to occur to make sure that that trust key can't be re-abused in the future. Okay, and then we get to certificate authority. So certificate authorities, if you have a root CA, um, this, I, you know, it's, it's summed up in two little boxes on a single slide. However, I promise this is like the bulk of your effort in a remediation, okay? Um, because you have to go to every endpoint and you have to like de off that, that. You, have to, you have to update the endpoint with the, with the latest uh, certificate revocation list. And you have to make sure that it accepted the latest certificate revocation list change. You have to make a whole new root CA. You have to push the new root CA certificate, public certificate to each endpoint. Then you have to go and offline it, but it's, 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 a, it's a real pain, okay? Um, all right. And so, you know, kind of summarizing everything just in the nick of time, uh, we get to additional auditing. So I always get asked this question, and I did get asked this question with that compromise event. What event ID should we turn on so we can make sure this doesn't happen again? And they're like, that's not really the answer. Like, there's, there's, I'm not going to give you a laundry list of log providers out there and be like, yeah, ingest all these bad boys, because I don't even know if you can afford the, the resources to do that. Um, and the ingestion rates might blow your, your SIM out of the water, and you never see any of these uh, attack IDs, right? So. Instead, I say start with use cases. Identify the use cases that you need for your environment. I gave you a laundry list of attack techniques that if you identify any of these in your environment, it's, a, it's you know, immediate bad, right? So take these techniques, let these be your starter use cases. Of the telemetry that you do or do not have in your environment, make sure it pairs up with some of these attack techniques. Come up with new use cases. Begin a detection engineering development if you're not already doing so in your environment. And turn on the necessary telemetry for those use cases. Don't just turn on a laundry list of auditing and hope for the best, okay? Because that particular client that got compromised, they had all the auditing in the world too, and they didn't see any of this, right? All right, so uh, in conclusion, okay, many organizations do not have custom detections, but we need to make sure that they do. Um, and if they are going to have detections, definitely have detections for those, those real critical uh, attack techniques that I just showed you, okay? Um, and then recovery. The recovery process is very time consuming and it's very money consuming. And I promise you, nobody has a budget for it. We need to be planning now, we need to be doing tabletops, we need to be doing exercises, and when you hire a red team and your blue team is going to execute against that red team, you need to make sure that the blue team is practicing the remediation, their eviction, and their triage procedures, and not just like, oh, we, we, we detected them, so that's good enough. If you don't know your remediation procedures work, you're going to be in a world of hurt if your organization is actually compromised, okay? 
Here's kind of where you can follow if you want to find the original slides. I definitely highly recommend download the original slides, use them. Um, I always have a couple slide decks that I always use over and over when I go do consulting for clients. Um, so highly recommend you, 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 you try to get some of those, all right? And I think that's just a little bit short. Any questions? I got like five, five six minutes for questions. What's up? Does the uh, ECS and then use a hardware security module, does that mitigate some of the privacy that Like what, like a TPM module or something like that? Yeah, or like a USB-based uh, HSM that does the actual signing. Okay. I'm not going to lie. Maybe. I don't know. I had to look into it. I haven't looked into that yet. I, I don't remember the white paper talking about it, though. Did, did you see that in the white paper? No? Okay. Yeah, I, haven't, I, haven't, I don't remember seeing it in the white paper, but maybe. Um, it might be a good idea to look into it. Any other questions? Yeah, I'll be super honest. If I don't know something, I'm going to just say, like, I don't know. I, I got to look it up. The NTLM off and it's passed to mm -hmm. target. Is that you, on the compromise code that they, they get local admin to do that, to pass that NTLM off, off to the to the target? Yeah, usually usually you need some kind of elevated permission on that host. On the host on the original compromised host, yes. Not the one you're not the one you're coercing. But all you need is local admin to pass that NTLM off. Yeah, I'm not even sure you need local admin because you're just coercing NTLM authentication. I don't think you you're just abusing the uh, it's uh, it's the ESF, like the ESF method. Um, if I remember correctly, it's a way that Windows natively will secure um, encryption for folders within Windows. And so you're using that ESF method to coerce the NTLM authentication. And there's multiple coercions as well, not just NTLM. Um, and there's, like, uh, there's, uh, there's a whole bunch of different relay modules set up to just like grab it and toss it wherever you want. So you can just don't toss it in the past. Right. Like, like, there's a whole bunch of hot fixes and a whole bunch of ways to stop coercion and relay from being successful, and those those are good. The the whole oh my god behind configuration manager abuse is that because SCCM does everything as local admin, if I am successful at coercing that authentication, I can essentially pass it to whatever target I want and be a local admin acting in the capacity of SCCM. Wow. Yep. Thank you. Yeah, the, look up misconfiguration manager abuse. I wrote like two or three different detection methods in there. I plan to go back in there and finish them out. Um, but but you know, look up misconfiguration manager abuse. There's like seven or maybe eight different attack paths that Chris Thompson and um, and uh, Dwayne Michael wrote up that are that are just aimed at like here's how here's how red teamers can go about doing this. Here's how adversaries can do it as well. What's up? How often do I see ADCS abuse? Um, like one of every three clients. Uh, we actually have clients that just contract us to show up and be like, can you find out if I have this attack path? And we're like, sure. Um, so we have like a whole attack path management service that's just dedicated on like automatically and programmatically enumerating those type of attack paths. So we'll, it'll go through all of them. And we like we throw like little parties every time we new, add like a new ADCS attack path to the laundry list that we got going so far and to our like Bloodhound product. Any other questions? Okay, I know that was a lot of information, and I'm sorry. Like I said, this is an hour-long talk. I try to truncate it as much as possible. Take the slides, use them, um, look at those event IDs. That way you have it. Anytime someone's talking about DC sync or someone's talking about, hey, do you know if you can detect a golden ticket? It's like, eh, let me go look at this, this, this talk I looked up one time and, and look at that data model. Use those data models on your own defenses. If you already have a detection engineering team or a threat hunting team, compare their use cases and their run books for detection uh, for those attack techniques to the ones I gave you. Not every event ID I gave you will be operationally useful. Some of them are just kind of a nice to have, but it, it contains a lot of context that you'll need to put the whole picture together. Okay? All right. Thanks, everybody.